Hello everybody, I'm Rado Antonio. I'm making this video from my home in Cluj-Napoca, Romania and I do hope you'll enjoy it. Now, Pedro told me via email that the mission of your event is to inspire students to learn something outside their curriculums and in doing so, develop differentiating skills. I think that's awesome and I'm honored to speak at your event even though I'm not doing it in person. My hope is that I'll be able to give you some important insights through this video that will help you think more accurately about our near future, about the next few decades. The topic of my presentation is sustainable energy. In particular, why we're taking so long to make the transition to renewable energy and what are some of the things that students can do to help. All right, let's get started. We are still a fossil fuel civilization. More than 85% of our energy still comes from coal, oil and natural gas. And as you probably know, we want to stop using these energy sources for two reasons. First, fossil fuels are finite. In the last three centuries, with the help of fossil energy, we've built a marvelous civilization. Our standard of living, health and comfort are higher than at any other point in human history. Naturally, we want this golden age to continue indefinitely in the future, so we want to get our energy from sources that don't run out. And the second, much more urgent reason we want to get off fossil fuels is climate change. Burning coal, oil and natural gas produces greenhouse gases which trap heat in our atmosphere and make the planet warmer. This is very bad because it makes polar ice melt and can rise the sea level by several tens of meters. It makes extreme weather events much more frequent and powerful. It can make some parts of the world unsuitable for agriculture. It makes the oceans more acidic and less able to hold oxygen. It can drive hundreds of thousands of species to extinction and ultimately destabilize the whole biosphere. In short, climate change makes the planet less hospitable to life and can spark severe human conflicts over immigration and lack of resources. Now, we've known this for several decades. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. So why are we taking so long to give up fossil fuels? We've got solar panels, wind turbines, hydroelectric dams, biofuels and many other new technologies. Why are we still burning coal, oil and natural gas in 2018? Initially, I thought it was simply because we were too lazy. And of course, that's part of the reason. But in reality, renewable energy has three major disadvantages compared to fossil fuels, and these largely explain why we delay making the transition. Renewable energy flows have low power density, and this makes them difficult to harness. They're suitable mainly for electricity production, not liquid or solid fuels, and they are intermittent. These disadvantages make renewable energy largely incompatible with the way we've structured our civilization. Let's briefly look at why that is. Power density is measured in watts per square meter, and it shows the average long-term rate at which energy is consumed or produced per square meter. Fossil fuel extraction has very high power density, which is why it's fairly easy to get all our energy from just a few extraction points. For example, Coal is extracted from surface mines with an average power density of 1000 watts per square meter, with the best mines delivering up to 12,000 watts per square meter. Crude oil extraction from conventional wells averages 650 watts per square meter, with the best oil fields in Saudi Arabia delivering 40,000 watts per square meter. Natural gas is typically extracted with a power density of 2300 watts per square meter, and the best fields achieve power density of 16,000 watts per square meter. Even oil extracted from sands averages 2,700 watts per square meter. The global rate of energy consumption is about 17 trillion watts. So if we assume the average power density of fossil fuel extraction is 1,000 watts per square meter, then to get all our energy, we need just 17,000 square kilometers of land. Renewables, on the other hand, have very low power density, commonly between 1 and 15 watts per square meter. For instance, the Sarnia Solar Park in Ontario, Canada, 
produces electricity with power density of about 3 watts per square meter. The Longyangzia Solar Park in China delivers around 4 watts per square meter. The Bavaria Solar Park in Germany, around 5 watts per square meter. The Topaz Solar Farm in California, 6 watts per square meter. Agua Caliente in Arizona, 8 watts per square meter. The California Valley Solar Ranch, 9 watts per square meter. And Olmedira Solar Park in Spain, also 9 watts per square meter. These are some of the largest solar parks in the world, and for all of them, the power density is lower than 10 watts per square meter. If we wanted to get all our energy from solar, assuming a power density of 9 watts per square meter, we would therefore need a desert solar park with an area of 1.9 million square kilometers. If it was placed in the Sahara, this is how we'd see it from space. Now, solar is the renewable with the highest power density. This means that if we didn't want to get all our energy from solar and instead added some wind, hydro energy or geothermal, the land area required would only get bigger. For example, the power density of the best wind farms in the world is below 3 watts per square meter. Anholt 1, the largest wind farm in Denmark, delivers around 2.2 watts per square meter, and Horns Rev 2 delivers around 3 watts per square meter. Nystead 2 delivers 2.7 watts per square meter, and Vision 8, located off the coast of Germany in the North Sea, delivers 3.6 watts per square meter. The London Array, which is the largest offshore wind farm in the world, delivers 2.3 watts per square meter, and the Sea Wind Farm, located off the coast of North Wales, delivers about 2.2 watts per square meter. If we wanted to get all our energy from wind, assuming a power density of 2.5 watts per square meter, we therefore need a wind farm with an area of 6.8 million square kilometers. That's two-thirds of the area of Europe. But getting all our energy from solar and wind is the best case scenario, because it assumes we need only electricity. In reality, electricity cannot completely replace fossil fuels. Oil, coal and natural gas are important fuels or raw materials for six industries that are essential for our modern civilization. Fertilizer, steel, cement, plastics, international shipping, and air travel. The fertilizer industry uses natural gas to produce hydrogen, which is then combined with nitrogen from the air to produce ammonia, which is the basis of all nitrogen fertilizers. If we stopped using natural gas, they could extract the hydrogen from water instead through electrolysis. This can be done, but it requires revolutionizing the fertilizer industry. Steel making depends on coal, or more accurately, on metallurgical coke, which is essentially pure carbon. When we take iron ore from the ground, we find it in the form of iron oxide. To make steel, we need pure iron, and the reason we use coke is to take out the oxygen from the iron oxide. At the moment, we have no method of separating iron from oxygen using electricity. The only renewable alternative to using coal is using charcoal made from wood. Charcoal is essentially pure carbon as well, and it is made by heating wood in the absence of oxygen, so the wood doesn't catch fire. In smaller blast furnaces, charcoal can perform the same function as coke, but the problem is, charcoal is made from wood, and trees grow slowly. To satisfy the charcoal needs of the steel industry, we'd need a fast-growing tree plantation with an area of 1.2 million square kilometers. Here it is in Brazil. Cement is made by heating limestone to more than 1,500 degrees Celsius to produce calcium oxide. The high temperature is currently achieved by burning coal or natural gas. Potentially, it could be achieved through electricity as well, but once again, it would require revolutionizing one of the largest industries in the world. Plastics are made from oil and natural gas. Now, plastics are bad for us and they wreak havoc on marine ecosystems, so we should probably stop using them. But if you wanted to keep making plastics without fossil fuels, then we'd need to make bioplastic. Bioplastic can be made from alcohol, cellulose, starch, or plant oil. According to European Bioplastics, in 2017, the world produced 2.05 million tons of plant-based plastic from 0.82 million hectares of land. To make 335 million tons of plastic, which is our current consumption, we would need 135 million hectares of land. That means 1.3 million square kilometers. 
large cargo ships would be very difficult to power with electricity because they need very long range. At the moment, the energy density of batteries is still only a fraction of that of diesel fuel. If we were to power big container ships with the best lithium-ion batteries available today, in order for them to go from China to Europe without stopping, they would need such a heavy battery pack that the ships wouldn't be able to carry anything else. We could make these big ships electric, but only if they stopped many times along the way to recharge or replace their batteries. Alternatively, we could power the ships with biodiesel. But biodiesel is made with such low power density that to satisfy the needs of the shipping industry, we'd need a rapeseed and palm tree plantation about 2.3 million square kilometers in size. It's the same story with long-range jetliners. Batteries are still too heavy to allow jets to travel long distances without stopping. A Boeing 787-9, powered by the best lithium batteries available today, could achieve a maximum range of only about 1,500 kilometers. That's pretty good, but if you wanted to keep long-range flights without the use of fossil fuels, we'd have to use biojet fuel instead. Unfortunately, just like in the case of biodiesel, we'd need huge plantations of biofuels. 1.2 million square kilometers of rapeseed plantations and the 360,000 square kilometer palm tree plantation. Alternatively, we could use liquid hydrogen as aviation fuel, but this technology is not developed yet. So this is the second disadvantage of renewable energy. It's pretty easy for us to produce electricity from solar, wind or hydro, but it's very hard for us to make liquid or solid fuels. If we were to get all our energy from renewable sources and at the same time satisfy the fuel and raw material needs of these six key industries, then we'd need this much land for energy production, about 8% of the planet's ice-free surface. At the country level, it would look like this. The USA would need to devote about 13% of its land to energy production. China, 25%. Romania, 8%. Australia, 3%. The UK, 84%. Japan, 103%. And Germany, 77%. Without harmful biofuels and bioplastic, the percentage would go down to about 8% for the United States, 17% for China, 6% for Romania, 1% for Australia, 44% for the UK, 61% for Japan, and 44% for Germany. Portugal would have it pretty good as well. 20% of the land with biofuel and bioplastic plantations and 10% of the land with only solar parks, wind farms, and tree plantations for the steel industry. And finally, we get to the last disadvantage of renewables, their intermittency. Although over the course of a year, solar parks and wind farms could give us all the energy we need that year, they don't give us the energy when we want it. During the day and during the summer, they would overproduce energy, and during the night and during winter, they would underproduce. To solve this problem, we would need huge energy storage facilities. How huge? Perhaps a safe amount is enough to power the world for seven days. You might think that seven days is too much. There is no way solar parks and wind farms won't produce anything for seven days. But this does not literally mean seven days in which the solar parks and wind farms don't work at all, but could be 20 days in which they produce only 65% of what we need or 40 days in which they produce only 80%. In either case, the deficit would be equivalent to not having solar parks or wind farms for an entire week. It's not hard to imagine such a scenario. In 2017, for example, the solar parks in Germany in the month of December produced only about 10% of the electricity they produced in the month of June. Likewise, the Agua Caliente Solar Park in Arizona, which is one of the sunniest locations in the world, produces only around 70% as much energy in winter as it does in summer. If we were to store that much energy using batteries, the amount of lithium, nickel, lead, or zinc required would be way higher than the current known resources. So maybe batteries aren't suitable for the job. Pumped storage, compressed air, and flywheels are other good storage options, but again, we may not be able to scale them to our needs because of lack of suitable sites and water, low efficiency, or other obstacles. 
it's possible that the only storage option that could be scaled to our needs is hydrogen storage. We could potentially use excess electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen and store the hydrogen for when we need it. But that would require a radical redesign of our society, commonly referred to as the hydrogen economy. The message is that no matter what storage option we choose, it could turn out to be just as difficult to put in place as the renewables themselves. So now you probably have a much clearer picture of what it would take to get off fossil fuels and why it's taking us so long. We need country-sized fields of solar panels, wind turbines and biofuel plantations, huge energy storage facilities, new high voltage lines to carry electricity across countries, new ways to make fertilizer, steel, cement and plastics, and we need to make all forms of transportation electric or fueled by hydrogen. We basically need to change everything about the way we produce and consume energy. And we need to do it fast because fossil fuels are quickly running out and the planet is getting warmer every year. This is where we, young people, can make a difference. We all dream of making the world a better place. We all dream of having a good impact on the world. But because of the internet in our modern society, we are increasingly encouraged to work only in the service industries such as bankers or lawyers, app developers and software engineers, marketers and Instagram influencers, cryptocurrency experts and business consultants. All these jobs are great, but the problem is they are possible only because they are built upon the food, energy and manufacturing industries, which are the base of the economy. And the problem is the base of the economy depends on fossil fuels. Food production depends on fertilizer made with natural gas, steel made with coal, and diesel fuel to power field machinery. Manufacturing depends on steel made with coal and plastic made with natural gas and oil. Transportation depends on energy-dense liquid fuels made from petroleum, and construction depends on steel and cement. The base of our economy depends on fossil fuels. So as long as we, young people, students, chase only jobs in the service and financing sectors, the base of the economy won't change much. Even worse, we may just be strengthening the status quo. I think that to solve our energy problems and solve climate change, we need more people to work on changing the food, energy, steel, cement, fertilizer, plastic, glass, aviation, and international shipping industries. And unfortunately, these are career paths less and less young people even consider. What if instead of wanting to start an Amazon dropshipping business, we dreamed of opening a water electrolysis ammonia plant to make fertilizer? What if instead of wanting to be travel bloggers, we dreamed of owning a fast-growing tree plantation for the steel industry? What if instead of wanting to develop smartphone games, we dreamed of developing software that allows supermarkets to use reusable food packaging? to reduce plastic pollution. How would the world change if more bright students would work on getting fossil fuels out of the base of the economy? If we want to make an impact on our world, I think that's the way to do it. We need young people to be once again interested in agriculture, in manufacturing and in transportation. And there's a good reason to do it. Imagine how rich a person can get by changing one of these industries by getting one of these industries of fossil fuels. But regardless of the financial incentive, I think that to transition to sustainable energy and prevent climate change, we need more young people dreaming of changing the base of the economy instead of concentrating all their attention on the top layers of the economy. Thank you very much.